purpose of today's orientation is to make you comfortable taking a boat out and bringing it back, operating safely. The other part of it is to make me comfortable that you're taking the boat out and bringing it safely back. So uh, with that in mind, we just want to cover some things today. You should have received an uh, information packet that uh, we'll be going over here today. On that, you've probably already completed the boater education course, or you soon will. Uh, there's a link for that. Uh, there's also a link for the weather there. Let's talk about weather a little bit while you're going out. Um, there's several good applications for general weather forecasts. Weather.com is one. There's Weatherbug. There's several of them. They are good at predicting a movement of weather, um, a forecast of weather. There'll be kind of weather that comes in. We can see it coming, pass uh, over us. We will ask you to keep your phone on all the time. Uh, and if we call you back in, we want you to come back in because something's uh, approaching the port. Uh, there is another type of, of weather that will get us, and that's that thunderstorm that builds out over the lake. And you just see it. Doesn't look like anything's happened, then all of a sudden it mushrooms up and grows, and uh, that one is harder to predict. There's a real good app on here called My Radar app. Highly recommend you get that. It's nothing but radar. It's just about instant time, and it allows you to cover those type of, uh, of weather situations real good. So have that up. But again, if we call you back in, we want you to come back in. Uh, hopefully you won't uh, be sitting around in sunshine, but also much more important that you're not bringing the boat back in with thunderstorms and hail and rain coming down, so uh, keep that phone on. Then there's a reference here on knot tying, a couple levels of basic knot tying, which we'll cover in the on-water portion, and uh, some other ones just to practice. Two good leads for that. All right, we'll jump right into the operation of the vessel. When you go, you are responsible for the safety of the boat and uh, the safety of all your passengers. You're also responsible for any damage you do to anybody else's property or anybody else that gets injured. So you got to operate the boat safely. Uh, it's going to start right here dockside as you're checking out. Uh, we will cover a, a video uh, on safely getting on and off the boat. We'll just say that the biggest problems we see nationwide, even though they're very few, it's slip, trip, fall, getting on or off a boat. So you'll be demonstrating how we don't get on or off the boat with anything in your hand, hand it to somebody, uh, we'll demonstrate the wrist lock for getting on and off the boat, but we'll be very safe uh, getting on and off the boat. Um, the biggest problem we see uh, around here that I've just noticed is when you come out with somebody new. You'll start a crew relationship with your friends and your family. Uh, you'll have that down. But when you bring somebody else out uh, and they are relatively new at operating with you, especially if they happen to be an experienced boater, then we get the situation where two plans are in mind, they both get executed at the same time and somebody ends up in the water or somebody ends up hurt. So start off with a good crew side brief. Uh, discuss boarding, getting on or off the boat. Don't anybody get on or off the boat without you knowing about it. Um, talk about what you're going to do in docking. Uh, mention the propeller hazard back there. We want to know about that. Then also talk about some possible situations. There are things that could happen where you are going to have to be skipper of the boat. Everybody's going to have to do what you tell them to do and do it now or somebody's going to get hurt or somebody's going to get hurt worse. So we don't want to dampen the fun, but make sure they know where the safety equipment is, uh, just what you expect of them, and make sure you run the crew as, as skipper. Now when you get underway, uh, the safe operation of the boat is going to be dependent on several things. First of all, we've got to let you know that there is a two levels of fines you can get. Negligent operation, which can cost you up to $1,000, and grossly negligent operation, which can cost you a lot more and wind you up in a place that you're not going to like for a while. So we've got to operate the boat safely. That means we are going to comply with all the Coast Guard regulations, um, both inland and uh, offshore when you go out there. Uh, you are also going to have to follow any regulatory markers and buoys that are in the, in the uh, body water you're operating. Uh, you also have to comply with any local rules. So we'll have some here, and when you go to other locations, reciprocal uh, operation, make sure that you ask, are there any special rules on this body of water that you need to know about? Um, past that, the safe operation of the boat when you get underway is going to be dependent on speed. 
And what we're looking for is called a reasonable and prudent speed. And what that means is that you must be able to stop the boat in the distance remaining in front of you, whatever the situation. Uh, the uh, uh, people observing you are going to be considering kids on jet skis pulling out, somebody pulling out from a boat anchorage right in front of you. So you have always got to be able to stop the boat in the distance remaining. All speed control. It's the ultimate in defensive driving, if you will. Okay, we have a quick list of do nots. Do not cause a hazardous wake or a wash, and we'll tell you how to avoid doing that. Don't create a swell in a no wake zone. If it's dead calm, you got to be going very slow. Um, don't tie up to or attach to any regulatory marker or buoy out there. If you see a uh, mooring buoy, it's going to be a big white buoy with a blue stripe on it. Is the course covered that gives you that's uh, big enough that you can actually pull up and tie up to. So pretty much if something looks like something you don't recognize, it's probably marking something that you want to stay away from. So just if you don't recognize what it is, stay away from it. Um, don't, uh, you can anchor anywhere you want to on the lake, just don't impede traffic. That means not in front of a gas dock, not in front of a restaurant, uh, but we will cover anchoring, but just make sure that you leave the uh, fairway open for everybody else. Uh, don't allow anybody to ride anywhere you can fall off of the boat. That's not on the seat backs, not on the gunnels, uh, certainly not on the front of any tritune or pontoon. You've got to be inside the confines. On those boats that have a rear-facing seat that's very nice when you're anchored or drifting, you've got to be inside the boat when you're moving. Uh, obviously, don't go into any restricted area, designated swimming areas, and you'll be uh, instructed on where those are. To stay out of any restricted bathing areas or anything like that. Uh, some distances. A diver down flag is covered in the course. Uh, you'll see a red flag with a white stripe on it. Uh, you probably will not see it at most lakes around here, uh, but if you do, they're probably going to have some blue lights around them, which means there some other operation going on. But if you do see a diver down flag, you've got to observe the distances. Don't come within 50 feet of it. If you get within 150 feet of it, you have to be at idle. Um, another distance is 100 feet within a uh, within 100 feet of a law enforcement officer. Uh, we're probably not necessarily going to go over and say hi to them, but they're going to come say hi to us. And as soon as they get within 100 feet of you, you've got to have the boat at idle. So what's going to happen is they're going to drive by, take a look at you, probably go behind you turn the blue lights off and come on up and, and check you out. As uh, soon as you realize that, go ahead and stop the boat. Uh, what will they be looking for? First and foremost, boating while intoxicated. So let's cover the rules with boating while intoxicated. Can you drink and drive? It is discouraged, but yes you can. Uh, every time you go out with us, you are going to designate a sober skipper. It will be named on there. Here's the deal. 0.08 is the blood alcohol level for boating while intoxicated. So anybody, anybody that's going to touch that wheel, and only um, FBC trained operators can drive our boats, but anybody that touches that wheel has got to be able to pass a 0.08. So if you're driving and then your other uh, partner decides to drive for a little bit and you jump back on, they stop you five minutes later, they're going to say no. That person was driving five minutes ago, and we need to get a breathalyzer test. So, 0.08 to anybody driving that boat. I think another thing to point out is that will also transfer to your driver's license. You can use your, lose your license for 180 days, so serious deal. Um, 0.08 is also public intoxication in Texas, and we almost never see it enforced. But on the water, 0.08 public intoxication, if you happen to have a boat full of people like that, then we might be stepping back to that negligent or grossly negligent operation as a skipper. So keep the drinking under control. Remember that it's diff far different out in the hot sun than it is sitting watching television. So uh, word to the wise on that. Another, another thing on that also, just don't bring any glass containers on board the boat. And if you're going to uh, bring the liquids on, let's run it back to clear liquids. Uh, Dark fluids, coffee, red wine, grape juice, uh, everybody likes it, but the carpet and upholstery like it a lot more and they don't give it back. So 
clear liquids please. Um, okay, so if we uh, haven't broken any laws, aren't doing anything crazy, and we are not having a bunch of alcohol over the, all over the place, and by the way, if you want to meet the meet the uh, game warden out there, just give him a high five with a long neck as you're cruising by, and he will come see what you're doing. But if you don't have a bunch of alcohol around, you're being discreet about it, they're probably just going to stop you for a boat safety check. And they're going to be looking for a couple of things immediately. The first thing you want to see is a Type 1, 2, or 3 PFD for everybody on board. It has got to be right size, good condition, Coast Guard approved. So what do we have on the boats? Uh, we have Type 2 Universal Adult Safety Jackets. If you're going to bring out somebody really big or somebody really small, let us know and we can get a jacket on board, but that's what we're covered for. And by the way, they are safety jackets, so let's don't use those for water flotation. Uh, they just get moldy and dirty, so if you're going to get in the water float, bring your little floaties or get your own life jackets for that. Um, as I said, uh, small people, let's talk about children. Uh, children have to be wearing a life jacket any time the boat is underway. Now that is a legal term. Underway means you are not tied to the dock, you're not run aground, or you're not anchored. If those situations don't matter, then or are not met, I should say, then the child has to have a life jacket on. So one good way to get a ticket, to pull up to McDonald's, have the kids jump on board, put their life jackets on, and the constable comes up behind you and writes you a ticket for being underway. So life jackets on on the dock or the boat is tied up to the dock. Uh, just a, a legal term. Now those life jackets have to be readily available. The basic definition of that is if that boat sinks they can float to the top. So they can be under hinge seats, uh, set down seats, they cannot be in latched compartments. If the boat sinks they float to the top. If you go someplace and they have a bunch of them crammed in real tight so they don't come up it may not meet that definition and you may have to get out a life jacket out and readily available for everybody on board. The next thing you're going to be looking for is a Type 4 PFD, your throw cushion. That needs to be immediately available. Uh, good way to get a ticket on that or get caught is to be have somebody move that to put it in a more convenient place and you have to look for it. Think about it, it's for going overboard in a man overboard situation so it's got to be immediately available. They'll be looking for that. Uh, past that, they might want to see the registration, they might want to hear the sound making device, they want, may want to see the fire extinguisher, so generally know where those are. Uh, but that's what they're looking for. Just know that any law enforcement officer, if they want to, can put the crow's foot over and board your boat. Come right on board and take that boat apart. And if you mess up one of those first three things, don't look like you know what you're doing, they might just come in and give you what we call the full cavity check. So we don't want that to happen. What we're going to do is a little gamesmanship. You even think that you're going to be stopped by a game warden, a constable, any, any law enforcement out there. Go ahead and stop. Everybody grabs a life jacket. The skipper grabs a life jacket and the Type 4 PFD. You hold them up, sing a little jingle or whatever, and the guy's going to look you over and say, no alcohol, y'all been good, thanks for being safe boaters, and they're going to head on down the, down the road. And that's what we want to do. Okay. Uh, okay, let's talk about, bad word, accidents and casualties. None of us are going to get involved in an accident, but they call it accidents for a reason. Should you get involved in some kind of an accident out there, you have an immediate set of priorities, and they should sound familiar. You're responsible for your boat and your passengers. Once those are secured, you're responsible for doing the same thing for anybody else involved in an accident, but in this case, it's conditional. We don't cancel the first two. You don't go into harm's way to help somebody else. Secure your boat, your passengers, and stay on scene and help as you can with anybody else involved in that situation. Your best response on the lakes, if you have cell phone coverage, is 911. 911 is going to get you the uh, sheriff. The sheriff will probably get the constable or the uh, on-water game warden over there to help you out as much as possible, uh, as quickly as possible. If you outrun your cell phone coverage, in some places you will do that, uh, either they will have a handheld VHF board, some boaters get their own handheld VHF. thing to know about VHF in this situation is Mayday, Mayday, Mayday is a very serious thing. It does not mean you run out of gas. It doesn't mean you've 
Somebody's fallen or broken their arm. Doesn't mean you're lost. It means you are in immediate need of life-saving assistance. Uh, if you need it, use it. If you don't, it's going to cost you a lot of money. But just mayday, mayday, mayday with the information you want. If it's less than that and you're on VHF and you want to talk to somebody, there's some other terms, security, security, and pan, pan. But pretty much if you just say, anybody this channel, this is a Hurricane 240 out of the Water Point Marina, need assistance, somebody's going to chirp up, tell you what channel to switch to and help you out. But May Day is a, is a big deal. Once you get everything taken care of, all everything's secured, if you do more than $2,000 damage to anybody else's property in Texas, or if anybody is uh, requiring more than basic first aid or certainly lost, then we're going to have to do a boating accident report. It's time to get us involved. We'll help you fill out the boating accident report and the insurance claims. 